Maybe every poem, on some level, indicates the poet's most fundamental feelings towards life, by virtue of what he decides to focus on and how he portrays it. When we read, we might get a sense of whether the poet thinks life is bright and wonderful or dark and difficult, of whether he thinks man is doomed to despair or free to brilliantly succeed. While some poems reveal the poet's attitude very indirectly, some are explicit. Such a poem is Byron's darkness. This is how explicit it is. The first line is, quote, I had a dream which was not all a dream, end quote. So clearly Byron wants us to interpret the fantasy situation in this poem as a metaphorical depiction of human life universally. What was Byron's sense of life? Let me tell you through how another poet, John Keats, reacted to a different one of his poems. While on his way to Rome in 1820 with his friend Joseph Severn, Keats was reading the second canto of Byron's Don Juan. This canto is about a terrible shipwreck. Many, many die, and the plight of the survivors who are in a lifeboat without oars or sails is gruesome. In one scene, the starving survivors draw lots among themselves to see who should be killed so that the others can eat him. This is stanza 75. Then lots were made, and marked, and mixed, and handed, in silent horror, and their distribution lulled even the savage hunger which demanded, like the Promethean vulture, this pollution. One survivor is a surgeon, and he bleeds the unlucky one out, rather humanely given the circumstances. Here's the stanza after the victim dies. The surgeon, as there was no other fee, had his first choice of morsels for his pains, but being thirstiest at the moment, he preferred a draught from the fast-flowing veins. Part was divided, part thrown in the sea, and such things as the entrails and the brains regaled two sharks who followed o'er the billow. But the horror rises even from there. Here's part of the stanza that relates what happens to those who eat the human flesh. They who were most ravenous in the act went raging mad, Lord, how they did blaspheme, and foam and roll with strange convulsions racked, drinking salt water like a mountain stream, tearing and grinning, howling, screeching, swearing, and with hyena laughter, died despairing. Utterly bleak. Well, at one point, as he read this canto, Keats threw the book to the ground, and, as Severn reports, said, this gives me the most horrid idea of human nature, that a man like Byron should have exhausted all the pleasures of the world so completely that there was nothing left for him but to laugh and gloat over the most solemn and heart-rending scenes of human misery. This storm of his is one of the most diabolical attempts ever made upon our sympathies. Keats's sense of life, his deepest convictions of what life was to him, was so opposed to Byron's in this poem that he felt violent disgust, hatred, and indignation towards the work and even towards its creator. Like Keats, I don't share the worldview depicted in many of Byron's poems, so normally I wouldn't share a poem like this. But I want to share darkness because, for one, I think it's a matter of self-defense to see what the enemies of your worldview are up to, which can strengthen and clarify your own, and second, because I think this is a good poem. Although it's spooky and appalling, it has strong and beautiful lines. The events are compelling, clear, and poignant. It's a tremendous, vivid work of fantasy. The feeling it conjures up is complete and undiluted, and the progression of events rising to a kind of climax feels natural and inevitable. This is Byron's Darkness. I had a dream, which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished, and the stars did wander darkling in the eternal space, rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went and came and brought no day and men forgot their passions in the dread 
of this their desolation, and all hearts were chilled into a selfish prayer for light, and they did live by watchfires, and the thrones, the palaces of crowned kings, the huts, the habitations of all things which dwell, were burnt for beacons. Cities were consumed, and men were gathered round their blazing homes to look once more into each other's face. Happy were those who dwelt within the eye of the volcanoes and their mountain torch. A fearful hope was all the world contained. Forests were set on fire, but hour by hour they fell and faded, and the crackling trunks extinguished with a crash, and all was black. The brows of men by the despairing light wore an unearthly aspect, as by fits the flashes fell upon them. Some lay down and hid their eyes and wept, and some did rest their chins upon their clenched hands and smiled. And others hurried to and fro, and fed their funeral piles with fuel, and looked up with mad disquietude on the dull sky, the pall of a past world. And then again with curses cast them down upon the dust, and gnashed their teeth and howled. The wild birds shrieked, and terrified did flutter on the ground, and flap their useless wings. The wildest brutes came tame and tremulous, and vipers crawled and twined themselves among the multitude, hissing but stingless. They were slain for food, and war, which for a moment was no more, did glut himself again. A meal was bought with blood, and each sate sullenly apart, gorging himself in gloom. No love was left. All earth was but one thought, and that was death, immediate and inglorious. And the paying of famine fed upon all entrails. Men died, and their bones were tombless as their flesh. The meager by the meager were devoured. Even dogs assailed their masters, all save one, and he was faithful to a course and kept the birds and beasts and famished men at bay, till hunger clung them, or the dropping dead lured their lank jaws. Himself sought out no food, but with a piteous and perpetual moan, and a quick desolate cry, licking the hand which answered not with a caress, he died. The crowd was famished by degrees, but... Two of an enormous city did survive, and they were enemies. They met beside the dying embers of an altar place, where had been heaped a mass of holy things for an unholy usage. They raked up and shivering scraped with their cold skeleton hands the feeble ashes, and their feeble breath blew for a little life and made a flame which was a mockery. Then they lifted up their eyes as it grew lighter, and beheld each other's aspects, saw, and shrieked, and died. Even of their mutual hideousness they died, unknowing who he was, upon whose brow famine had written fiend. The world was void, the populous and the powerful was a lump, seasonless, herbless, treeless, manless, lifeless, a lump of death, a chaos of hard clay. The rivers, lakes, and ocean all stood still, and nothing stirred within their silent depths. Ships sailorless lay rotting on the sea, and their masts fell down piecemeal. As they dropped, they slept on the abyss without a surge. The waves were dead, the tides were in their grave, the moon, their mistress, had expired before. The winds were withered in the stagnant air, and the clouds perished. Darkness had no need of aid from them. 
she was the universe.